Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Lee McLean and I go by the pronoun she. I am an art quilter within the textile studio in the advanced studio practice program here at uh, New Brunswick College Craft and Design. And of course, we're all on Zoom, so that's the virtual here. Um, today is our 11th lecture, and I'm really excited to have Tracy Austin as our guest speaker today. Mechanics, heads up, this session is being recorded. So by staying and participating, you're consenting to being recorded. And a gentle reminder that you can be seen and heard. So if you haven't already done so, please turn your microphone off to avoid feedback. And if you experience any glitching, turning off your video can help. The opinions given are strictly those of the speaker and don't necessarily reflect those of the NBCCD, the ACC, or Sheila Hugh Mackay Foundation. Lastly, I ask for your patience and understanding with the technology because as we most of us all know, <laughs> it's a, a different delivery mode and doesn't always cooperate as expected. Hopefully today everything goes well. To officially begin, we're going to go over to Allison for our territorial acknowledgement. Thank you, Lee. Um, this, on this unceded and unsurrendered territory where we live and work, the peace and friendship treaties were signed between 1725 and 1779 by the El Nu, the Wolastic Wiwit, the Passamaquoddy First Nations, and the British. These peace and friendship treaties were among the earliest treaties to be made between Indigenous nations and Western nations. Despite the efforts of the Canadian government since Confederation to assimilate and erase Indigenous peoples through government policies, such as the Indian Act and the Residential Schools Act, the resilience of Indigenous people has meant that Indigenous traditions continue to influence the Canadian political, social, cultural, and environmental landscape today. Thanks, Allison. Um, now we'll go over to Audrey to tell us about the guest lecture series. Unmute, Audrey. I said thank you, Lee. You're welcome. <laughs> This guest lecture series is sponsored and made possible by the Sheila Hugh Mackay Foundation. It is organized by the Advanced Studio Practice Program at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design in partnership with the Atlantic Center for Creativity. The purpose of the guest lecture series is to model successful contemporary practice to our students and to inform, inspire, and ignite art and design dialogue and engagement in the greater public community. The guest lecture series provides this by giving a platform for presentation, creating time for dialogue, and by celebrating the creative and cultural riches that we hold in Atlantic Canada. Thanks, Audrey. Now over to Joe to tell us about our partner, the ACC. Thank you, Lee. Uh, the Atlantic Center for... Uh-oh. Sorry. Um, the Atlantic Center for Creativity is an initiative that promotes creativity across disciplines. It has three main goals. One, to promote research and programming in the area of creativity and innovation. Two, to offer events such as symposia, conferences, and workshops on a yearly basis for sharing ideas and information. And three, to build partnerships in the area of creativity and innovation on a local, regional, and national basis. You can get additional information and check out the new online journal, Creativity Matters, by visiting the website, atlanticcenterforcreativity.com. Thanks, Joe. And now for the reason that we're all gathered together. In this talk, Tracy Austin expands upon her creative process and her career that includes both production and contemporary art. She will speak about the art of fashion as well as its inclusion in the world of craft. Austin is a fashion artist who creates fully functioning miniature textile sculptures that capture emotion and visage. Her contemporary practice is inspired by nature and is fused with a dark and rich Gothic style. She has worked at NBCCD for over 10 years and is the current coordinating instructor of the fashion department. Over to you, Tracy, please. Thanks so much, Lee. Yes, we finished off there. I finally crowned myself the queen of fashion, so I'm going to go with it here. 
<laughs> so I'm so happy to be here today, guys. And um, I'm just going to prelude my my little slideshow here with, since I won't be able to see the um, the chat when I'm talking and I'm doing kind of a fluid presentation, please just feel free to yell out your questions and uh, I'm good at coming back and getting back on track. So there's no problem there. Okay. So feel free, everybody. And uh, if nobody wants to talk and you just want to put it into the chat, you can do that. And maybe one of our moderators here can help me with that. Okay. All right, so thank you all for coming and I'm going to dive right into this here so we have lots of time for the questions afterwards. Okay, guys. So I'm going to switch over here and share my screen. All right. Okay, and I just want to hide those. Perfect. So let's get this rolling. So um, I've been asked a few times to do the ASP lectures, and I've never really been able to uh, to get together what I wanted to talk about. And uh, I think I finally got my thoughts in order. So I want to get moving here and uh, showcase what I think is really important, and that is the inclusion of fashion and craft, which a lot of times gets tied to being exclusive to runway shows. Um, and while that's a part of the fashion industry, there's a lot more to it than that, as well as um, fashion artists as craftspeople. So I changed the title a little bit to Fashion is Craft. Oh, and of course, nothing wants to move forward. There we go. And the creative process. Okay, so a little bit about me and my journey here through fashion. Um, I'm on a bit of a, uh, a little mission here to, to take back the word fashion. I think I was always a little bit afraid of it because of its, its ability to be a loaded word and uh, how people portray it here. So I started off calling myself a costume artist and um, have moved forward now into calling myself a textile sculpture artist and a, a bunch of different words and things like that. And I always used to talk about art and not craft. So I think there's a couple of things here I want to take back and um, I'll talk about them throughout the presentation. But fashion and craft are two words that I find have a lot of uh, weight attached to them with what people's preconceivements are of them. And by doing that and using this presentation, I want to try and educate people a bit more on what exactly fashion means. So my little journey here started, uh, well, probably earlier 2005 from when I started in a NBCCD, but I did graduate the fashion design program in 2007. And I always like to tell people here, when I came in, I knew I wanted to design fashion, but I wasn't quite sure, um, or I guess I wasn't confident about my ability to sew because I didn't have any uh, real sewing experience other than a little bit of handwork. So I have to say a lot here about the program at NBCCD because now I'm a miniature um, precision sewer, I guess I would say, and I learned all that here at the studio. So it's really um, says something about the school itself and our ability to teach people right from ground up and how to design. When I graduated, I began freelance dog clothing design. And I started that under the original name of Pretty Petal Designs, I believe, and then I ended up switching that to Steam Petal later, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, in 2010, I became the technician for fashion. I was very, very excited about this because I was working a retail job as well as trying to get my art career going. And it was just, it was really stressful when you're doing something you just have to do to get the bills kind of paid. And then being able to come here as a technician, I was suddenly just relieved because I was doing work that mattered to me. I was, in, I was surrounded by creative people and it really got me going again with what I wanted to be doing. Uh, 2011, I began teaching leap and night courses, so I picked up those uh, various times over the different years. And then in 2013, that's when I relaunched uh, Pretty Petal Designs and launched Steam Petal. In between 2000 and 2013, I had been taking work, but um, I had always been building to the, the, what I would call perfection of the technical ability of what I was doing, and I felt I had reached my height on technical abilities. Um, so I launched Steam Pedal as a rebrand at that point. And what I did when I launched Steam Pedal was I took away the custom work in the way that I was no longer letting my clients design because they're bad at it. <laughs> I'm the trained one who was uh, here to bring the fashion that people were looking for. So instead customizations and custom work turned around to tell me about what you're envisioning and I would move forward with that. And that's where I started working with Steam Pedal. And I feel like that itself gave me a really um, intense look at fashion as craft and moving forward with how we look at um, 
so much as us having to meet the standards of fashion and not that fashion should meet the standards of the people. And I believe that kind of started this little, this little bee in my mind that got me going later and moving through things, okay? Uh, and then I decided that I would uh, work on Seam Bell for a while. It's technically still active, though I am in the process of closing that down as I put my decisions out or my um, creativity elsewhere. So in 2018 is when I started falling in through weight of power and uh, moving my personal practice forward. I'm working under uh, Tracy Austin Atelier and I'll have all those links and socials and things at the end of the, the process here for you guys. And in 2018, I received two grants, actually a couple of weeks apart from each other. It was a really, it was a really good week, a really good month. And um, I received both the Arts and B grant uh, for Weight of Power, as well as I, I won the Art Kitchen event through the Connection Artist Run Center. And uh, that kind of just was the world telling me, let's solidify this and get going. And that's when I moved forward into working almost exclusively in contemporary arts. At 2019, I was able, in 2019 rather, last year, I was able to move into an instructor, which was good because I was kind of breaking those boundaries as a technician already. I can't help myself. I have to get in there and talk and help everybody and all that. So I was able to move into an instructor uh, foc uh, focusing on business and uh, business as craft. And then in 2020 this year, uh, there's a pandemic going and everything's crazy, but hey, I moved into the top of the studio this year, taking over curriculum where I'm restructuring our business and just being so happy with our current team of what's going on in fashion and really moving it through. Right now, I'm so happy my students and instructors are all watching. Hey guys, thanks for being here. And um, we're excited to move in here through what is fashion and helping educate everybody else. So I'll move along here with uh, my personal work. And we get into this bit here. So this is just my artist file broken down into a few like key points, which I'm gonna actually demonstrate visually throughout the presentation. So um, I am known for creating almost exclusively in miniature scale. So miniature scale for me is um, a third scale and smaller. Lately, I've actually been punishing myself a little bit and working in one sixth scale. Can't help myself, but I like doing those little details. I'm inspired by dark Gothic and occult themes often merged with the beauty and ferocity of nature. I work in a tailored style with a focus on corsets, jackets and pedal skirts. Those are very heavy with the pattern drafting side of things. I've really enjoyed that aspect of um, creating and stretching my limits on what I can do with that. Um, be, uh, beading, embroidering and custom appliques are something that I work on often to be able to create the from a miniature scale. I have to customize those pieces and create new appliques and things out of existing ones or just creating them from scratch myself. I use art to recognize the struggles and strength of women, which I will touch on again here in a bit. And I often follow the theme of a light in the dark. So all my different pieces have um, different, all my different lines have a theme of their own, but they do follow the light in the dark bits. So this is some of my current uh, practice work, just so you guys can see a little bit of the detail I'm working in here. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna handle more of these pieces as we go through, but all of these were either um, part of Way to Power, they were part of faculty exhibitions, or uh, they were part of um, custom work done for the school. You guys can probably see at this point, I have a bit of a theme going. I very much like my violets and golds and black, and that does continue through my work a lot, though I do have some specialty pieces coming in here. So steam pedal was something I mentioned that I ran um, from 2013 to currently. And I just want to showcase a little bit of this work. The, um, the steam pedal work is based on either one third or one quarter scale pieces that are built on these dolls. And they're called um, Asian ball jointed dolls. And what drew me to them is they're a customizable style of fashion doll. Um, and what's so interesting about them is they're made out of a resin, which means they can be sanded down and customized to whatever people want. The faces can be done however you like. Their hair is actually a wig that goes on, so you can change the different styles of wigs and things on them. The eyes come out. So the whole thing is a, is a whole customizable package. So the, the artists who make the dolls are craftspeople on their own. And then on top of it, I decided to enter into this with the clothing as well, because I really wanted to be able to customize those pieces. Another thing that, that was helpful for that, though, is people were able to accept the price point of the dolls and the craftsmanship and things like that. Where price point on fashion is 
something a lot of people argue with because of the fast fashion industry. So when we went in, when I went into fashion with the dolls, I didn't have to struggle as much with that. People were willing to pay um, $400 and up for dolls. Suddenly my clothing prices were fair depending on the ratio of the doll to the clothing. So I didn't have the same struggle that a lot of fashion artists have where they struggle with um, people valuing their time because they're constantly fighting with fast fashion brands that are selling things that are being made unethically, they're being made cheaply, things like that. So there was a nice, um, it was a nice place for me to enter into my production business because there was an argument there I didn't have to have. The clients were relatively, um, educated on that and uh, it says a lot for the struggles that fashion artists go through in full scale that they have to spend so much of their business arguing over that. It's not as much arguing it's actually like proving yourself you have to tell people exactly why and it can be really overwhelming sometimes to have to go in there and tell everybody every time exactly what it is you're doing why your time is worthwhile and I think as crafts people and everybody here who is a crafts person we can all entertain that thought and understand that a lot of time is spent with us having to tell people why things cost a certain amount which means that um, the societal side of things has and the the mass production side of things has kind of warped the public's view on things, which is too bad. But it's also nice that we're kind of taking that back a little bit. I see lots of movements happening and lots of people looking for um, for ways to for ways to be educated and considered what the things they're purchasing. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you for answering that question for me, Rachel. Yes, the um, how tall are these dolls? A, a third scale is a third scale of the human body. So roughly that's about 60 centimeters tall. Just to give you guys a little bit of an idea. If I were holding something up, it'd be about this big. Try to give you guys a little bit of size there. Okay, perfect. Let me know if there's anything else you guys need to see. Is everything else looking okay, Lee? Perfect, thank you. All right, let's move to the next one. So why fashion? So I thought I would use a couple of images that I built here. So when we start talking about fashion, you, you start going, well, why? Why am I doing this? And it can be any, any aspect of art, which medium you pick, why you picked it. So I did a little word map here, some things that inspire me. And then I found this lovely little tag that I really enjoyed. And it says, I probably won't wear this dress again because it's already on my Instagram, 100% fast fashion. So I think that is a whole social issue that we could get in here and talk for a whole hour itself on. But I wanted to showcase that in where we go, who are we designing for and what values do they have? What values do your clients have? If they're looking to wear it once and never wear it again, are they your clients? We have to be considerate of that and also make sure that we're not trying to fight against the flow of things by chasing after the customers that are not ever really going to be able to be our customers because they don't take the time to understand and be conscious of the things they're putting onto their body and into the world. So I put all this together and I was thinking through this reason of why fashion. And I thought, okay, well, let's talk about the fashion process first. So. The fashion process kind of goes this way and sorry for my really weird way of thinking through it here you guys are going to fluidly working through my brain but first there's inspiration then we talk about the concept what concepts are you pulling from all that inspiration we start designing around those concepts we have to start pattern drafting mocking and fitting and sewing the final garment my students are probably all going ah yes yeah, she just made us do all this that's great so we all still do it regardless of what stage of uh, designing you're in. And I think this is one of those things where it doesn't really matter which um, medium you're into here. Everyone starts with the inspiration concept design part and we just change the end bit into what medium they're working in. So to talk about it a little more, this is the inspiration I started with one of my pieces here. And I want to talk about the difference between primary, secondary and color inspiration. So first we come up with an idea here about what primary inspiration we want. And what that means, it's things unrelated to the craft itself. I'm being inspired by a thought or a process here. And then in my secondary uh, inspiration, you can see where I'm actually talking about the fashion process of things. I'm thinking about what fabrics I wanna use, what styling I wanna use, what, emote, what uh, mood I want to evoke, what my models will look like with 
the various accessories and things like that. And then from the two boards, I'm mixing them together to pull out the color inspiration I'm looking for here. And this is the base process that we do for creating our fashion lines here at NBCCD, but also any fashion artist that moves forward will be constantly thinking about these things, regardless of they lay them out like this in a cute little package, you're still doing this process in one way or another. I don't think I know a single artist and maybe not even a single person who doesn't have a you know, file somewhere on their computer full of like little pretty things they like or um, a drawer of stuff or Pinterest full of things. So everyone's always being inspired by something. And whether you go through and curate it like this or not, you're still doing the process. So that's that's important to recognize and to uh, take a t the time and just think about it a little bit. But then I was thinking more, okay, why fashion, why fashion? So I said, no, really, why fashion? And that leads us to feminism, everyone's favorite. So um, I wanted to touch on feminism for a couple of reasons. And I feel like it was because I was having this ongoing struggle with my art and my craft and fashion. And I really don't like the connotations that go with it. There's this sense of um, vanity that goes with fashion when people bring it up. And this sense of, um, well, like a lack of value that you don't wanna pay for what it's worth because why would you when the fashion industry exists and things like that. So I started talking about feminism a little bit and I started thinking, okay, what parts of it do I not enjoy? What parts of it are really bothering me? So I think if I could put it down into one mood, it's the feeling I get, or when you see other people who they put their clothes on and you're going, oh, it looks nice, it looks nice. And they're pulling, they're pulling at their clothes because they feel uncomfortable, not so much because of the clothing, but because of how society tells them they have to feel. Oh, I can't wear that because it's the wrong color. I can't wear that because of the pattern. I can't wear that because of the cut. All these things that go through our mind that muddles up the craft and artwork of fashion because people get stuck on this, what they have to be, that you have to be a size two to fit into the thing you go buy at the mall. So it turns into this process where the, the, the people feel like they have to fit the, fa the fashion model. And that's not what it's about. We have to wear clothing. We as a fashion um, program and as a fashion world and fashion designers, we have a responsibility to make sure that our clothing are fitting people and not that we're forcing people into being certain images. So there's that fight and I had to think uh, a really long and hard about whether that was the fight I wanted to go with. And I found out that feminism makes me really angry. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to educate people about that. But then I wanted to create garments that I was using fashion as like craft and not so much as, as a social aspect of it. I want to talk about all kinds of themes and be inspired by all kinds of different work and using fashion as my way to showcase that. So that's what led me into my miniature pieces because I didn't want to exclude people. I didn't want people feeling, oh, well, I can't wear that. That's not for me kind of thing. Instead, I made it so nobody can wear it. And instead we're looking at fashion as a way to express emotions and feelings and concepts without it being stuck into a social construct. I found this quote here I really liked. Uh, Robin Gavon, she is somebody who um, does a lot of journalism and a lot of, she has a lot of opinions on a lot of things. I recommend you guys look her up, but I really liked this quote here. And what it says is how much of fashion is fueled by insecurity for better or for worse. And I think that's a really deep thing we need to start thinking about um, and what, what it drives and what it's necessary for here. It goes back to our Instagram talk. It goes back to our how people are feeling when they're putting clothes on. Are they feeling that the clothes are doing their job or are they creating more issues than they're, than they're fixing? And that's something that we need to think about. And I think we all have our different opinions on that. But that's kind of the question I ask myself often about what it is I'm putting into the world and why I'm putting it out there. So I want to express that. Okay, moving on a little bit. So back to the fun stuff after I've, oops, after I've yelled about feminism a little bit. After we do our inspiration, we get our concepts down, we have to start creating our design. So these are a bunch of different designs that they're not part of a line or anything, they don't go together, but uh, that I've worked 
done over the last little few uh, years. And what I challenged my students with was they had to do 60 designs for me in a week. And then they brought them to class. We went through and we picked out our favorite ones. And then I sent them home and made them do 60 more, which I'm sure they're really pleased with me about. And then after that, we got people from all different areas of the school. We got some alumni to come in where they came in and responded to the designs at face value to see what people are thinking about them, to see what the fashion eye appreciates, people who are trained to understand how things go together versus what people in the public understand and what they see and what they feel about the pieces so that we could get a general idea of what we were looking to create. So we're taking all these ideas, we're trying to focus them down and get them into a place where we can start building concepts and lines and pieces that go together here. And that's where we come into our preliminary design. So the first 60 were the prelims and then we move into design variations and this is where I start showing them that we can start working through our design variations with color, with changing necklines, with changing different parts of the designs without having to start over but being able to get a different look to them and this is a process that I want to highlight because it's something we do often and we never really stop doing this process. And sometimes we don't move past this process. We get to this part, we go, the line's not really working. I'm not sure if I'm gonna create that whole piece. And we move on and we go to the next thing. But this storyboarding process is um, how fashion can go through and see what variations we want to. I usually tell my students, okay, what colors are you going with? And they might have some ideas, they might not, but I say, okay, well, let's start drawing them down. If I know I wanna go into warm tones, we can play around with that. If we wanna play around with completely different concepts of which way we want to take our color or designs, we can do that in this stage. You'll see my designs all look um, little carbon copies of each other. So in fashion, we don't want to be taking the time drawing the fashion figure every time. So a lot of times when we're sketching, we'll play around with something called a croquis. So we have a base form that we then draw the clothing on top of. So these are my little croquis that I work and I can't help myself. I'm actually a miniature in everything I do. These look, look bigger than what they are. They're actually only two inches tall. I do actually do miniature fashion illustrations as well. So I don't think I can escape the miniature side of me. And that was, that was something I was interested in long before I came here as an artist. So there's, there's some parts of yourself you just can't fight. And I think you just need to move forward with them. And I've embraced my miniature side here. Uh, the next step we do is it kind of coincides with everything we're doing at the same time because we start going with pattern and how we're going to make it how we're going to put it together so sampling becomes a huge thing for us here in fashion because we want to make sure that the things that we drew out 2d can actually translate to something 3d to make sure that the fabrics are going to do what we want them to and if they're not find a way to make sure that we can force them to do those things so these are just some examples of my sampling pieces here i usually like to uh showcase it's my process when I'm going through things because I'm I'm not one of the ones that likes to that so much just enjoys the final the final piece. It's all about the process of getting there. That's the part where you're able to uh, to really let your creative side go and problem solve and, and figure out how you want things to come together. The final piece is your cute little reward at the end. So I think it's really important for people to see the whole process that you went through before you got there. And then. These are um, some of my very quick technical illustrations. I don't do uh, technicals as much anymore. I usually sketch them out because I'm the one who's designing and the one who's creating. But these are really handy for people to make so that they know what pieces their outfits are gonna have, especially somebody who does fashion illustration and concept work where they're not as detailed with the pieces that they're doing. You might not know what garment pieces are actually included in a design. So this is the breakdown of one of my pieces. I'll show you guys a little bit later. It was for the pop-up gallery for the 20th fashion show for NBCCD. And I did a piece called Glory. So it was consisted here of a dress, a cape, and a waist cinch corset. And these are just a flat so that people can see where it goes together, um, what trims I was going to be using, how many pieces it had, that kind of thing. And this was created so that I could put my application in and we knew what the studio was looking for, which leads us into pattern pieces. So I do pattern drafting a little bit differently because everything's so small. So I showcase two different corsets here. And these are the tiny pieces that are used to create the corset. And I wanted to showcase them next to a quarter so you guys could see how big they are. Um, what this is, is a lot of times in fashion, we draw our patterns in quarter scale 
first before we draft out the whole big pieces so we know what we're drawing before we get there i kind of just end at that step i do it in quarter scale make the patterns and then start sewing but uh i thought it was a cute little way for you guys to see the different pieces here i try to put as much information on my pattern pieces as possible but as you can expect i am very limited in my surface area so these are just a few pieces here so this each of these here the orange one and the green one they are half of a corset because we would then cut out these pieces and then we would flip them all to get the other side of the body. So if you were looking at these here, the, the top one has six pieces. So the corset itself would have a 12 piece panel around the side of the body. And that's only the outside part. If we have the inside lining, that's another 12 pieces. And if we're doing the inside laminating, because of course we are, we would have another 24 pieces. So well, that's what goes into these little pieces that are about this big. Um, I was laughing the other day because somebody was showing me how they had to get inside a cuff. I was just like, oh, you would not like to see the little pieces that I'm working with. <laughs> a lot of people see this and they go, oh, you must hand sew everything. I don't hand sew anything, I don't have to. So with these size pieces here, I do everything on a machine. The only thing that gets hand stitched is usually slip stitching or a little um, topical details like appliques and beading and things like that. So precision sewing does happen. And remember, you can learn it at any time. Moving on, this is what we call mock up and fitting. So after we've done these pattern pieces, we need to make sure it works. Does it do what we want it to? So we don't want to go in and build it right off our silk. I mean, it's a little bit less of an issue for me because the pieces are smaller. But if you're going to be buying silk that's $50 a meter or something, you don't want to find out your mistakes in the middle of doing that. So instead, we work with a, with a, um, a cotton called muslin. It's usually undyed, which you can see the cream color here. And uh, that's where we figure out how things are fitting, if things need to be adjusted. So I would, uh, I would originally make something called a basic block would be a step before this. I don't do it anymore with my, my smaller pieces because I don't have the luxury of fitting people anymore. So I don't have to do that. But what we would usually do is we would figure out the second skin first, which we call a block. And then we would move into patterns, which is what these are, where I'm actually mocking up what would be eventually a garment. And these are some examples that I was working on of a fitted bodice with uh, ruffling details, working around the bust, things like that. And I wanted to then showcase how I went from the patterns to the mock-up and fit to what would be the final garments. So those mock-ups turned into these pieces here. I didn't end up doing the whole skirt in the mock because I figured out how it was going to go and I worked in it into the, uh, the cotton pieces here. So this was, um, Actually, the green one was something I did here when I was a technician, we had a showcase. So I had built this dress for that showcase and it got so many uh, public reviews on it. I made a couple more and put them up for steam pedals. So they were part of that. And, um, but I was, I was happy with them because I was able to have the whole process documented. I'm really bad at documenting the whole process now because it's kind of ingrained there after 10 years of sewing, but I was able to find all the pieces here for this one. So I thought I would showcase how those transist into each other. And that brings us to 2019. Oh my God, it feels like it was forever ago, but it wasn't that long ago. And this is where I launched um, my first contemporary line. It started out where I had two pieces put into it before I actually launched it professionally here, but uh, I'll walk us through the process of that one. So the name is Weight of Power and it was made, the pieces in this set were made between 2018, the end of 2018, leading into 2020, but the, the bulk of it happened in 2019. So this is the first part and it became uh, a piece that I really wanted to talk about um, how fashion made me feel and I wanted to concept I wanted to do a concept of making something that had a bit more meaning than just being a, a, pute, a pretty dress I kind of felt like a lot of times people come and they see fashion they go oh it's pretty and then they kind of move on so I did this piece called Auric and it was for the staff show here at NBCD for the show called Persona so I took it very seriously and I started breaking down what I wanted to talk about here. So I, of course, did a pretty dress and I played around with the pedal concept, which I do a lot with my uh, my nature based work here. But I did a piece that at face value is just a pretty little thing. But then when I explain it, it's a little different. So this piece was meant to be um, what it costs for my outer persona. So generally I, I try to show myself as 
put together and confidence and authoritative and never really showing weakness and things like that. So what does that persona cost? And what it costs is this dress, which if I were to walk in it, would weigh me down. It would be flinging all over the place. I wouldn't be able to fit through doors. It would cause a lot of issues there. It's a corset that's cinching my body together. So I can't really breathe all that well. It's super tight and uh, confining. And it has a coat that doesn't have sleeves, which doesn't close in the front. So it's not gonna be keeping me warm. So I wanted to show the, the, the first face value version of this piece and then the, the process you see when you think about it a bit more and what would it actually do realistically. So that was my first break into weight of power and I got a lot of good feedback about this piece. And it sort of got my, my brain thinking and the cause working. I really wanted to do more concepts like this because I think every face that everyone puts forward costs something. I especially focus on women, of course, because I'm very interested in uh, feminism, which I screamed earlier, but I really wanted to focus down on those things. And it started to launch this, this line in my head for weight of power, where I would talk about certain feelings and certain aspects of our life and what they cost and then what power we gain from them. So yes, there are moments where I feel weighted down and I feel cinched and I feel cold, but ultimately I can master those things and put forth a persona that I want to. And that's where this kind of launched off in this whole new process. I was very honored to have uh, this piece go to the Beaver Book Art Gallery. It was part of the uh, McCain Show, which is the Atlantic uh, Contemporary Art Show. And that uh, was at the Beaver Brook until this spring, I believe. It was over there till February or March, I think. Uh, so it was really nice to have her there. And I was very proud to have this here because a lot of times fashion is excluded from craft shows and art shows. It's not seen as something that has a place outside of a runway or outside of a store. So after being told many, many times that fashion isn't included in that, fashion doesn't get grants, fashion doesn't get these different things, I made it kind of a personal vendetta to kind of prove them wrong and do it anyway. So I was really excited and honored to have this piece in this show. And then I decided, well, let's talk more. Let's do weight of power as a line. And these are the first 10 that I decided I would do. Of course, Auric is already on there and complete. And I want to start working through the other ones. And uh, I'm going to come back to them. Don't worry, I'm going to show you guys them all. And that's when the Connection Arc happened. I was kind of trying to get this ball rolling and I was applying for everything. I actually applied for the Beaverbrook show while these uh, two grants were also happening. So it was kind of a big... Uh, a big ball of things happening that moved really quickly, but uh, Connection Arc here, they ran the art kitchen and they were able to help me fund these three pieces here, which are Despair, Destruction and Hope. And these pieces were also talking about weight of power, but were very personal to me because it was the first time that I admitted publicly that um, I suffer from long-term depression and that I wanted to do pieces that showcase the different moods that you go through when you're experiencing these things. And I wanted visual, virtual kind of things that people could see here. So these were the three pieces that I had put up for the art kitchen piece. And uh, I did win that and went on to create more of them. So I'll showcase those here. So my first concept for was despair. It's for the part when you, you really can't move on, everything feels crushing, you're kind of overwhelmed, you're always drowning. And I wanted to focus here on some intense coloring work and not be afraid to showcase what that feeling feels like. And that's where I created this. Sadly, I don't have another full body picture of this poor lady, but um, the red bleeds down into the, as you can see here in the picture, I actually reversed the colors of this piece here and put more red into it because I wanted to showcase this despair isn't her death. It's a moment in time while you're mastering this aspect of yourself, this mental side of yourself. So I ended up switching the pieces because you have the black edges instead of the red, because the, the red is more your vitality. And I wanted to showcase that. She does have a noose around her neck, but she's meant to be hanging. I made it very pointed that this piece never be hung because it's not supposed to be representing that. It's supposed to be showing you at that brink where you feel like you can't go on and then you find the strength within yourself to move on from that point. Then despair went into destruction. So here's the mood board for destruction here. And the colors I decided to pick. I wanted to go with um, rich warm tones mixed with things that were actually being destroyed. 
and destruction turned into a really interesting process and it was at this point in this process that i realized everything that i was putting these emo these emotions i was trying to capture to create them i sort of had to feel them i literally was destroying fabric and burning things and putting things together and reassembling them and disassembling them and reassembling them again to get to these pieces and i think that's part of the process when you're creating art that you're really putting your emotions to you're feeling all these feelings and processes and emotions that you're going through this and you're literally putting those blood sweat and tears into your art and I think this was a really um, cathartic experience for me to be able to go and showcase a way of how this feels by processing it on my own terms and what I was making here and of course I wanted to put the the other side of the whole thing which is hope and this part this piece stood out very much when I showcased it because I very rarely work in blue and I made that decision to do this knowing full well that you would walk into this gallery of pieces that were red and black and orange and uh, violet and things like that and then this giant blue piece that drew everyone's attention it was a it was a fan favorite for a reason but I think it also really hit home on the hope side of things so the hope side isn't all um, pleasantries of course is entwining vines there and there's some darkness mixed in there even on our most hopeful days we always have that what if thought at the back of our minds but uh i wanted this to overall be a very inspiring piece that let us you know look for that as i said earlier that light in the dark that we all kind of need when we're looking for strength within ourselves so that was the first section of weight of power and then I was able to go forward with Arts and B, and they let me create um, five more. So I found them about a week ahead of each, uh, apart from each other. And uh, so I was like, hey, I can make three pieces. And then I found out I was making five more. So I was suddenly making eight pieces in the same time frame. So what was gonna be done in the first half of uh, 2019 spread throughout the whole year. And Arts and B was uh, pleasant enough to let me take some extra time on that and uh, I was able to move into five more pieces. So without any more uh, resistance there, the first one was um, Igis. And what Igis is, is a sort of shield. And um, what I wanted to put out there was I was, I was really getting involved in working with other people and um, finding that I was in a position to inspire people and motivate people and to make people think about how they feel about things but because of that there's a weight that comes with that in the way that like you you question yourself you go am I telling people the right things am I saying the right things which then moved into ideas here and what this is is it's this relatively put together piece that's telling you what um, you would like to hear and what you should be hearing but at the back of it here you see the straw sticking out from the piece there which is where you're your self-doubt is coming from. And at the back of the piece, I did a spine because you really have to have this sort of, um, this hard spine and backbone to stand up for yourself and really believe in what you're, you're telling people and what your motivation is and how you want to inspire people. And I think that some days that's harder to do than others, but uh, ultimately it all comes together in this really delicate package where you experience those things and, uh, even though we have a little self doubts, we really do know what it is we're trying to say to the world. So that was, I guess. Then I moved on to Dread. And uh, a lot of people that knew me get a kick out of this one. Uh, if you don't know, I have a very, very bad um, fear of spiders. Like it's, it's ridiculous, I always say. It's actually to, to the point where it's embarrassing. And um, so looking up the spiders for this piece was very <laughs> hard for me to do. I had to go in and find the prettiest spiders I could find so I could focus on that instead of the things that kind of set me off on edge on them. But I wanted to, um, to do something that was a bit literal, but also a bit figurative with dread here. So I did build this uh, the spider to go into this dress here. But what I want to talk about was the dread that people can experience about things, it's kind of also what fuels you to move forward. Uh, it doesn't get any easier with being afraid of things, but what happens is you get better at managing it. Uh, so while I have a hard time with spiders, I can manage it now and again, but also the things that worry, that worry you can drag behind you and kind of, kind of weigh you down a little bit. And you've, you've got to be able to look at it and go, okay, yes, I'm afraid, I'm nervous, I'm anxious, but I'm going to move forward anyway. And I'm going to move forward with that in the way where I'm going to dissect what's bothering me. So I built this spider here and I wanted her to be beautiful in the way that I understand how much spiders bring to the world. I understand um, 
and their use and that they're just a cute little creepy crawly thing that does what it needs to do and yes I'm afraid of it but I can still see the value in that piece and I really want to talk about that because I think when you're pushed to the brink um of your of any aspect of your life really that's when your true character is really shining through you find out what part of yourself really comes through when push comes to shove when you're under pressure do you take it out on other people or do you contain it so that you can help others around you when you're afraid of something I found so many people who are afraid of something until somebody else is afraid of the same thing and then suddenly oh I can do that for you so you're not upset I think about with phone calls all the time I don't like making phone calls but if I have a student or somebody else who's like I really can't do that it's really making me upset I'm like okay give me the number let's go forward and do that and I feel like the spider thing kind of works the same way for me here where it's um processing that that dread and being able to grow from it at the end of the day next up with pat was passion and this is one i wanted to talk about because it brings me back to that um that feeling i said when i see people put on clothes and they start picking at themselves because they're self-conscious and things about about themselves and it always makes me feel sad and that's why i did with passion too i see people who are really passionate about things and they get chatting and then suddenly they stop talking about it. They, they get, they really come up and they go, oh no, no, sorry, I went on and whatever. And they feel embarrassed that they were so passionate about something. And I think that it's so sad that we, the, that experience is quashed sometimes. And I think people should always be able to throw their passion out there because as you can see here, the black overcoat is trying to quash the red of the passion here but the passion is going to come out anyway. It's spilling forth and it has all these little bits and pieces. And I just wanted to celebrate that extra thing, that thing you're excited about, keep being excited about, um, keep being excited about that. Don't hide it, really embrace what it is you want to move forward with. And this is the back of her here. So of course, anything in the front that's slightly contained isn't contained at all in the back. It's kind of like the passion just like flies behind you sort of thing. So just make sure that you're being true to yourself and being able to, uh, to move forward with that. Even though you might have that weight on, your, on yourself where you go, oh, maybe I overshared or maybe I was too excited. It doesn't really work that way. Everybody is going to know how you feel about certain things because you're not going to be able to contain yourself. And it's really just a point of embracing yourself and moving forward with that. I did resilience and this piece here is actually the piece that launched the whole concept of weight of power and um, it was actually funny because it was the last piece I built I really I saved it to the end because I really wanted to make sure I did it right and um, what I did with that was uh, I built this piece here and what was inspired by us is walking to work and we had got a snowfall kind of like recently where we we got a little bit of snow yesterday but not too much and I was walking to work and I saw these pansies and they were growing up through the snow anyway and they were orange and and purple and red and there's bright colors growing up through this white snow and I just thought wow they sure want to live really like it just kind of inspired me so much so originally this coat was going to be white uh, with some different colors but I instead I kept remembering the orange pansies that were going through the snow instead so I decided to do a completely orange coat and uh, do the the details of the pansy work here in black and violet so I really enjoyed building this piece here um, and what it is is underneath you can't really see in this picture all that well but there is a wire cage happening under there it's meant to resemble a bunch of roots and what it is is us trying to um everything we're dealing with kind of all bundles up together. We kind of make, end up as this mixed little package of everything we want to do. But overall, we have this, uh, this resilience to move forward regardless of what struggles we have going on. So this piece meant a lot to me and I was really happy to finally complete it. And we're just about done. I've got tenacity and boy, did this one need some tenacity. So with this piece here, what started out was a, with a little beading work turned into a lot of beading work. So the whole thing, it's hard to see here because of the black lace, but I beat it everything through this bit here. There's actually a pattern that flows through there. I do have to get some better images. Thankfully, uh, Haley was able to take some better ones for me here for created here, but um, it's one of those pieces I really need to document at some point but I can't tell you the hundreds of beads that are in this and of course I couldn't just leave it at like a couple lines I had to bead the whole length of the piece so good thing she's little because if not I think I'd still be beading and uh, a tenacity was definitely one that tested actually this one probably took more time than two of the other ones put together so just the amount of bead work that had to go into that and finally I got 10 pieces done and I felt like something was missing. I was putting all these pieces through and saying, oh, this is how I 
showcase how people feel about things. This is the weight of things that I decided, okay, maybe I need to put my money where my, my mouth is and invite people to come do this piece. So I invited uh, over 70 female artists from around the maritime side of uh, the art world here. Most people from Fredericton or people who had, um, had a, they had done something in the art scene in Fredericton. So I invited a lot of people to help me with this. I had fashion artists, textile artists, uh, metal smiths. I had somebody doing some paperwork. So there's a lot of different artists mixed in through this. And this is the concept sketch I gave to everybody about what I wanted to do. I wanted to have this mantle of petals. And I gave a, a, a color sampler just so you'll see what I was working with some of the other pieces, some petal references. And I said, okay, I'll see you in the fall and hopefully we can get these things together. Of course, everything kind of got a little meddled up more a little bit late. And of course, uh, then COVID happens, but I was able to complete this piece. And I got us to this final bit here, which was shown at, created here for the Psyche uh, exhibition that happened earlier in the year. And this piece will also be going to the um, Craft and Bee Atlantic Symposium. So I'm very excited about that because everybody who was included in the piece will get that as part of their resume as well. So I feel like it really brought uh, the women artists together with this. And uh, this piece, while tiny, she weighs a lot. Let me tell you, that cape itself is very heavy. And I was just really, really excited for this piece. And it's nice because I always have a little part of all the people who have inspired me over the years included in empathy here. And now, where are we? Okay, 2020 was kind of crazy. It was finishing up empathy and then it's just, you know, the survival mode. I think we're all kind of there as we talk over the Zoom call instead of being in person. But uh, I am not, uh, not giving up on things. I was showcasing how I stay motivated, which is I have this big board in my office. People come in, they go, oh my gosh, Trace, you have this giant mood board. And uh, this mood board has spawned every line I'm working on and probably will work on for the next little while. I want to showcase the little pieces I do um, in my books. I like to think of where my designs would be and what kind of location and feeling I want to evoke with them. Uh, weight of power was very heavy for me. So I want to, oh, there's some, some pieces from my sketchbook. Sorry, forget about those. Those, those sketchbooks you guys are doing as uh, students and you guys watching, you'll continue to do them for the rest of your life. Whether you think you will or not, you will. And, um, what I wanted to showcase with these was I have that thing with like a new sketchbook where I don't like to put anything in it. I feel like I'm going to ruin it. So this was my way around that was I cut things out and paste them in and kind of curate the book a little bit. So I just wanted to showcase that a little. But since Weight of Power was so heavy, I'm going to do Co uh, Coven in 2021, which has less social concepts and more straight up um, design concepts of where I want to explore some different techniques, some different work. And then I'm back to it in 2022 with, with Wither, where I'm gonna talk about the social effects of uh, fast fashion, as well as um, everything to do with eco science and nature. And that is where I end my piece. Sorry, that is, I went on for a good like 50 minutes and uh, hopefully that we have time to answer some questions. So I'm, I'm gonna stop my share there. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. No problem. There were some questions, people understanding the scale of your work. And as you went into the whole series that you did, how big are they? Uh, they're about 60 centimeters for the most part. They range from 50 to 60 centimeters tall. And uh, I should have brought one with me, but they are just a bit bigger, well, a little bit bigger than my water bottle right. Both here, right? So these are not very big pieces. Because, um, yeah. As you went from one to the next to the next, they look so complete and intact. <laughs> and, and the par there's part of me that wants to know, where did you find those little itty bitty buttons? Yeah, no, they, uh, I have been collecting and looking for sources for quite some time. And actually I was even surprised when I found out seed beads came smaller than I, than the original size you usually see everywhere. Uh, Mary Beth actually and I found them even smaller when we went to a, a, a rock and geode kind of sale thing. And I was like, okay, it comes smaller. Well, I need them all, of course. So wow. I'm always finding little, little things I can pick. Wow. See if there are other questions in there. I, need some water. I had a question. Yes. Um, 
So it's very interesting how you, you have a philosophy and you feel very passionate also about language and uh, labeling and words. And I know that you described yourself throughout your talk as being um, a fashion artist and also the reference to making contemporary art. And then also um, the need, uh, and I guess your want to claim back the word uh, craft and to see fashion as a craft. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering about the space in between about design, because many people label fashion as a design or applied art. Like, mm -hmm. is it problematic or is it just that you feel a sense of freedom that you move through all of those uh, descriptions? Uh, I think it's by using all of them. It helps the people realize that they all belong to fashion and it doesn't matter what part of the fashion process you are you, you need to be all those things if you end up being a person who's just going to pattern draft well you need to have that design experience to know how it's going to work if you're going to be somebody who just wants to design and draw the fashion illustrations you need the pattern and sewing experience to know that it actually can be functionally made so by doing that, I realized I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into any of those words. I didn't want to shy away from any of them. I wanted to be fluid with them. And that's something that I'm trying to impart upon uh, well, anybody who'll listen to me, honestly, uh, because I think it's really important that people see the process that goes behind actual um, methodical and thought out fashion, that it's not just being something whipped off a... Um, a production line somewhere where the workers are underpaid and there's not proper design going on there that people shouldn't be feeling bad because they're wearing a garment that was made improperly it shouldn't be the person's fault it should be the garment's fault because it wasn't made properly so if you want to look at the craft of fashion it's a craft that considers all of those things and isn't just there to make um, the ten dollars for that instagram post tomorrow thanks tracy Thank you everyone for your comments on the side. I'm seeing them now. Oh, that's nice. I'm glad to talk. Really happy to be here. Do I have a question. Do sure. you think we'd ever have a chance to see that series all together? Yes, that was the plan. And then COVID hit. <laughs> so my eventual plan is I actually want to put weight of power um, into a gallery setting, but I'm not sure if I want it at a gallery. I was actually thinking of trying to get it all displayed in a mental health facility. Oh, wow. Because I think sometimes we, we run into issues of how do we say what we're experiencing? And a lot of times that is done through art. So there's no reason why it can't be something that's put out there that so people can respond to it at a visual level instead of just trying to come to words all the time. It's the, how are you feeling? And people ask you that you start crying because you don't have any words for you just overcome with emotion. And I think that visually we can respond to those things a lot differently and to showcase that you can experience and work through those, um, those problems you're having or those, those inspirations you're having uh, on a visual level, regardless of what your craft is. So while I am talking about fashion, I do think this applies to every artwork they're going through. I think that we we sometimes feel like art only belongs in galleries sometimes. And I was actually, I can't even take take uh, the claim of this idea. Megan Black had actually asked me, why does it need to be in a gallery? Have you thought about anywhere else? And as soon as she said it, I went, oh my God, it needs to go somewhere yeah. that's publicly accessible that people don't feel like they can't go to. Like sometimes people feel intimidated by galleries and things like that. So let's put it right into the mental health center and have that happening. So that's uh, that's the game I, gameplay I have at the end. But of course we have to wait for the world to get back on track for that but that is where they're going yeah that's a lovely idea um tracy to think about such beautiful manifestations mm -hmm. of an emotion uh, and the putting those two together in a, that particular site that that's very powerful <laughs> well, thank you thank you i'm glad you think so yeah i feel really strongly about it so i'm hoping that it uh that somebody else can relate to it and uh, maybe feel a little understood or represented in a different way well, Tracy, you've been photo bombed there while, while you're talking. Your students put a note on your window behind that says, we love you, Tracy. <laughs> so they are showing really? appreciation. It was very cleverly put oh, up there. Oh, they're so good. I didn't even notice. I'm too busy looking at Lee here, being like, I'm answering this question. Uh, they're <laughs> sneaky. <laughs> sneaky. Uh, love my fashion fam. They're the best. <laughs>
Well, I'm responsible for keeping us on track and I see that it's one o'clock on my computer. And Tracy, that was wonderful. Uh, that Thank work you. just went by so quickly. I wanted to look at it for much longer. <laughs> I want to thank you and everybody else for attending. And uh, I guess this is a point where I tell people that our guest next week, December 3rd, is Peter Thomas in thank conversation you. with Jean Rooney. And we'll look forward to that. And uh, I thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you for, for sure. And this is a wonderful series. Thank you to everybody that makes it happen.